On Wednesday, the Need and Out event will be here from 2 to 4 to have the Flame Center open to receive donations, as well as you can drop off items Thursday, May 4th. Uh, if you have the opportunity to pre-price those, those would help our women as they organize this sale. And I hope you're sharing with your friends and neighbors this great opportunity to come find some hidden treasures at the yard sale and help support uh, local missions and missions throughout the world. What a great opportunity to grab a new treasure and also share the love of Jesus. Uh, if you have a student who's connected to our church graduating from high school, please let them know that next Sunday, May 7th, is the deadline to apply for the ACOC Williams Scholarship from our UWF. We want to make sure that we are supporting our high school students as they make this next step in their chapter and journey. And then on Mother's Day, on Sunday, May 14th, our UWF will be celebrating candle burning. This is an opportunity, again, to support the mission of our United Women in Faith and the work that they do throughout the world by honoring someone in your life or holding a candle in memoriam for someone that you love who's joined the church triumphant. You have the opportunity the next couple of weeks uh, to offer a donation towards UWF missions and uh, to have that candle burn for one minute in honor or in memory of the person that you designate. There's a special envelope in your bulletin just for this purpose. So we hope that you'll take the opportunity to join in this mission fundraiser. Also on Mother's Day, we'll have a hospitality Sunday, uh, an opportunity for all those moms to take off from having to make breakfast before you come to church. We'll have some good sweets and savory items here, so I hope you'll join us for coffee hour uh, in between Sunday school and worship and following worship as well. The last announcement I have to share with you is a short item of business that our uh, administrative council needs to take care of. Uh, because of a family conflict and because of a family moving, we need to replace our alternate delegate for annual conference. That is something only a charge conference can do, and so our district superintendent has worked with us to have a called charge conference next Sunday directly after worship. The voting members of our charge conference are the voting members of our administrative council. So if those administrative council members could stay right after worship, come up to the front pews, uh, this will be a business of item that we can take care of pretty quickly, um, just within a few moments if we all gather quickly. So please note that we'll have a charge conference called next Sunday for the purpose of uh, voting a new alternate delegate to annual conference to make sure that our church has accurate representation at our gathering and <coughs> conferencing through the IMS's church. With all of those announcements shared, I invite you to join your hearts and your minds together as we enter the Lord's presence. Shepherd Lead Us it can be found on page 381 in the United Methodist Hymnal, or the words are projected on the screen. We'll sing all four verses. Thank you. 
Good morning. Who thought I was about to sing a solo? <laughs> Who got a little scared? Yeah. <laughs> so, how are you? Excellent. I love that. So, I've got a question. Okay, so I know that I see you come to church every Sunday with a pretty special person, right? And what is what do you call her? Gigi, okay? So, we love Gigi, right? And Gigi has some really, really special friends in the church, right? Who is one of those special friends? Just one of them. She's got a bunch. KK. KK, which is also Miss Hornsby to a lot of us, right? Miss Carla Hornsby? Is that who that is? KK, raise your hand. So I got the right one? Okay. So I say all this to say that. I say that to say this. So I was, how old are you? You're eight. So how old was I when I, I was younger than eight when we started coming to this church, right, Mom? Yeah, so I've been coming to this very church long before, like, you, like, eight, I was probably four or five when we started coming to this church. That's a long time ago, right? I know. So I hope that when you are 21, like me, that you will, <laughs> that you will be... <laughs> <laughs> hey now, that you'll be able to like look back and you're going to see like the generations of people that were friends with your Gigi and your KK and even Miss Debbie and all the wonderful people that have been with you through your entire life, impacting you, loving on you, making you who you are and who you were. And it's just, it's a cool thing to sit back and watch. So some people would call that like the circle of life, right? People call it all different things. So there are some, there are a lot of special people in this church that have watched me grow up. They've watched my kids grow up and they have been really, like it's, they've been really special to me. So there's two people though that are super special and I'm not going to make her cry, but although I heard she was sobbing earlier, <laughs> but I want her to know that I remember when she was friends with my parents and then she watched me grow up. She watched me become a parent. I saw her hug my kids this morning and she said, I've watched, we've watched you grow up, her and her husband. So do you know who Mr. Nathan and Miss Carol are? Do you know them? You probably do if you saw their face. Do you see them raising their hand? Yes. So what I want you to know, and well, I, what I want you both to know is I, my prayer, I pray all different kinds of like different, like random, just random prayers for like people that I love, people that have impacted me, people that have just been there for me and don't even realize that they've been there for me, been a rock for me when I thought, and I'm going to be the one that cries. When I thought that life was just, you know, it was just tough. But for me, having couples like y'all watch me while I was watching you has been nothing short of a blessing. And for little ones like Luke, I hope that he gets what I got and what I continue to get every Sunday when I come to church. Um, being in a small town is hard sometimes because people know your business. Um, just ask my kids. Yeah, everybody knows the gingers. So, but it's a blessing. It's such a blessing to be a part of a small church that's in a small town because people love you. They genuinely love you. And when we watch you grow up and become who you need to be, it's, it's a gift. Okay? So I need you to do me a favor. I got these for... Can you go take those to Miss, Mr. Nathan and Miss Carol? Can you see them? Can you take them? Okay. We love you and we thank you and for just endless things that you've done for me and my kids. And I know I speak for the congregation when I say, like, there will never be another. So thank you, and uh, we will see you soon. Okay, you want to pray with me? Okay. Say it after me. Okay. Dear God. Dear God. 
Thank you. Thank you. For giving us special people. For giving the special people. Like Mr. Nathan. Like Mr. Nathan. And Miss Carol. And Miss Carol. Amen. Amen. Okay. <laughs> service will have an opportunity to send you off with farewell and blessing, and we look forward to that as we pray for your next chapter in life. Friends, I hope that you've been, uh, or you've had the opportunity to engage these past few weeks in our 829 prayer challenge. Uh, on the Sunday after Easter, I invited each of us to spend these 50 days of Easter between Easter Sunday and Pentecost Sunday. Uh, when we remember the resurrection of Jesus and then the powerful gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, to spend either time at 829 in the morning or 829 in the evening in prayer for our church, for our community, for our world. To ask God, uh, where are you leading us in this season? Where are you leading me in this chapter of my life? Uh, Lord, what do you have for us together as a community? How can we share your love? As we're, as we're engaging in that prayer together, I trust that the Holy Spirit will lay a vision on the heart of some person in this congregation for something that we can do or respond to in the world to be the hands and feet of Christ. So I hope you'll be able to join us as we continue that prayer towards Pentecost Sunday, which we'll celebrate at the end of next month. Friends, as we come together now, we come together as the community of faith to lift one another up in our moments of weakness and hardship, and to celebrate with one another in our moments of joy. So friends, what joys or concerns do you have to share this day with this community? Yes, Phil. Debbie, still sick. We're glad that she's getting better slowly, and it was great to hear and talk to her this past week. But we'll continue to hold Debbie in our prayers for healing. Are there other Prayer, joys, or concerns? Well, if there are no others to lift up, then will you join me in a moment of prayer? <coughs> Risen Savior, you are our reliable shepherd. And Lord, today as we come to worship, we pray to hear your voice calling us to follow you. God, we remember our ancient brothers and sisters and siblings of faith throughout the centuries who have gathered in prayer and praise. Today, too, we gather in prayer and praise to lift up to you our thanksgiving, to thank you for all the wonderful things you've done in our lives, and, God, to praise you for your faithful love that has never ended, even in our moments of hardship and trials. God, we pray as we come together and worship that you would enliven us with your resurrection power, a power that sets us free from despair and sets us free to experience the hope of new life in you. God, enliven our hearts with your abundant life so that your living power might flow through us in all that we are and all that we say and all that we do. Loving Savior and Good Shepherd, it's your voice that we know. But we pray that you would be with us when we walk astray. For we know, God, that we are distracted by the voices of strangers. And we follow those strange voices sometimes to dry pastures and dark valleys. We forget your voice of love and begin to feel small and lost. We fear that we will not have enough to go on, much less have enough to share and offer to others. Yet, Lord, you know us by heart and by name. So in this moment, in our songs of praise, in our times of prayer, in your word read and proclaimed, God, call us once again. Help tune our ears to hear your voice. 
guard and restore our souls. Walk ahead of us on the right path that we will follow you, remembering your voice as we pray the prayer which you taught us to say, Jesus, as we pray now together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When I was asked to sing today, um, we thought it would be appropriate to sing the scripture reading for today, which is Psalm 23. Um, but I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because I opened the bulletin and the very first thing I saw was farewell to Nathan and Carol Rawls. And I slammed my bulletin shut. I said, oh no, what have I agreed to do? And then Debbie talked about special friends and how, how much they have impacted your life. And of course, Nathan and Carol have had a huge impact on my life because Carol was behind the scenes at my wedding um, as the coordinator at my reception, and she doesn't know how much she meant, that meant to me. So if you all could turn to page 136 and help me sing this song, that would be greatly appreciated because I might choke, choke up a few times. So. <laughs> Uh, 
at this particular page, there are the comforting words from Psalm 23 in the King James Version, which is probably the version uh, for many of you, like for me, that's written in my heart. Today we're going to hear this familiar scripture, though, from the Common English Bible. The words might be a little bit different, but we'll still hear that message of comfort and peace. So I invite you to hear these familiar words, but in a new way, as we turn to Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil, and my cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you join me in a moment of prayer? Will you pray with me and will you pray for me? God of grace, as we come to worship you today, our hearts meditate on this beautiful promise from Scripture that surely your goodness and faithful love will pursue us all the days of our life and that we will find our home with you, that we will be a guest at your table, that in every season of life, you will shepherd us and be the guardian of our souls. Holy God, that is what we name grace. And we know that that is the core of who you are as our Heavenly Father. So, Lord, now I pray that you would draw me beneath the shadow of the cross by that great grace. That what is heard today are not my words, but yours. Your words of promise and life. And what is felt in all of our hearts are not our own desires, but your will, O oh Lord. For you and you alone are our strength and our redeemer. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Isn't it comforting to come to church and to hear a familiar and comforting passage like this one today? This passage of scripture so well known to us. Sometimes the lectionary can throw us some difficult teachings and passages. I remember a little over a year ago following the lectionary leading up into the season of Lent and walking through some of the most difficult passages Jesus has for us. Passages we might know well because we hear them every few years, but still those types of passages that make this preacher wonder, how am I going to share this in a way that helps point to the good news that people don't feel like I'm stepping on their toes? I remember in that season, Carla Hornsby being a great friend to me and saying, You've had a couple weeks of rough ones, haven't you? It's been hard to prepare the message week after week with all of these heavy scriptures. But today, on this beautiful spring Sunday, the lectionary offers us this gift of a scripture passage that feels like an old friend, doesn't it, in the 23rd Psalm. We may have heard it in a different language from this different translation, different words, but the message of comfort and care it stays the same, even as the beautiful language of the King James Version probably was still ringing in your ears. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, if I'm honest, I can't remember a time when I didn't know at least part of this psalm. Can you, can you remember a time before these words of scripture were part of your heart and your life and your relationship with God? Even for the person who may not know much scripture, if any, by heart, these words still seem to be familiar. 
I'm sure thankful, and I know you're thankful, that somebody along the way, some Sunday school teacher, some friend, some parent, took the time to care enough about you to teach you about the Good Shepherd that we learn about in Psalm 23, to help these words be written deep within your heart, to be tucked away in your mind, to be turned to in good times and in bad times. This is the second church where I've had the great privilege that every Sunday where I stand up to preach, I can gaze on an image of a stained glass window that reminds me that Jesus is the good shepherd of our lives. As I look at Jesus surrounded by sheep in beautiful colors as light shines through, a reminder that wherever we go, God is with us, helping direct our steps and paths. Over the past few years, my heart has been drawn especially, though, to the last line of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That word that we translate as mercy in Hebrew has said it means committed love, loyal love, faithful love, like we heard in the common English Bible. It's a love that is constant. These two words, goodness and love, they are the two words used in the Bible most frequently to describe who God is. Goodness and love, that is the God that we worship. Goodness and love, that is the shepherd we are following, the God of goodness and love. So as we look at the rest of this psalm, as we sink into its familiar imagery, we are reminded that at each and every step, it is goodness and love that follow us, that pursue us, that are God's way of reaching out to us each and every day. We hear from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. But you see, the problem is that as human beings, often we think that we don't need a shepherd right you might think i'm not a sheep i don't need to be led anywhere i don't need a shepherd i'm grown up i've had this life experience i can run my own life i can make my own decisions i can be my own shepherd when we think that we're being our own shepherd i'm worried if we're being a little bit naive because there are always forces in our life that we don't have control over, but that impact us all the same forces that change the way that we live. Just think of all the different forces, political, social, economic, medical forces that we don't have a lot of control over. We might have a little bit of say in, but at the end of the day, we're not the one making those decisions. And yet those decisions from those different forces impinge on our lives in ways that we cannot control. When we're really honest, there are even forces within us, our own compulsions, our addictions, our hangups, our habits, our grudges, these different things that also impact the way that we live. Oftentimes, we're not really in control of those different habits or hangups, even though they shape our daily actions, and perhaps even they control us. So when we say we don't need a shepherd, or we can make our own decisions, or we can rule our own lives, or be our own guardian, we forget that we probably do have a shepherd, even if we think we don't. But maybe that shepherd is one of addiction or a bad habit that's indifferent or unappearing to us, but doesn't actually help us experience abundant life. Or maybe that shepherd is one of anger or fear, and so we run to any source that can help us feel comfort, but they don't offer us comfort that lasts, because when someone offers you comfort from fear, they often have to still stoke that fear to keep you coming back for more. Those shepherds of addiction, of uncaring indifference, of anger or fear, those shepherds of habits, those shepherds of compulsions, they are not good shepherds in our lives. And when we pretend they don't exist, we miss out on the opportunity to turn away from those bad shepherds to the good shepherd. The good shepherd that we discover in Psalm 23. That's what this psalm is inviting us to do to follow the good shepherd of our lives, to follow God, the shepherd of goodness and love. 
That's how we'll know the voice of our shepherd. We'll know that it's the voice of our shepherd Jesus when that voice is pushing us not towards anger or fear, but to goodness and love. When we give our lives to this good shepherd, when the Lord truly is my shepherd, then I will learn that I lack nothing. I want for nothing. I'll no longer be fixated on trying to get the things that I think I need or want, because if the Lord is my shepherd, then I can trust that God will provide what I need. And if God is providing what I need, then I can relax and let go. The psalm offers us these beautiful images of God's care. What God does to take care of us, to guard our souls. Here in Psalm 23, we discover the God who leads us to rest in green pastures, who brings us beside still waters who offers us moments of rest and reassurance. Sheep don't like to drink from dangerous, swift-flowing rivers, and so this shepherd, he finds us just the right spot to rest, to be restored, to be cared for, to be guarded. We hear that God makes us lie down in green pastures. God gives us the food that we really need, and like stubborn sheep, perhaps, God has to bring us along a little bit by force when we resist the things that bring goodness and mercy into our lives. The psalm tells us that the Lord will lead us beside still waters. When is the last time you took time to be still with God? That moment of stillness brings us rest and reassurance, but in our busy and hurried world, it can be so hard to come by. But it's only when we stop and slow down and choose to be still with God that we can let go of our worries, that we can let go of our hurry and our schedules and our tasks. In that moment of stillness with God, we discover the peace that lets us, let, allows us to let go of our resentments, our grudges, our ambitions, even our own ego. When I am simply still with God, it is then that my soul is restored. Restored with the love and mercy of our Savior. It's then that I can go and do things that are beneficial and healthy and healing, not only for me, not only for my neighbor, but for the whole world. In those moments of stillness, God heals our hearts so that we might begin to reflect more fully the love of Jesus and the world has changed heart by heart by heart. We hope that our life always looks like green pastures and still waters, don't we? But we know that life has its own turns. Suddenly the sky can turn dark, gray clouds can gather, and we'll find ourselves in the darkest valley. That pleasant morning we hear about at the beginning of Psalm 23 fades away and the troubled waters of life begin to swarm and swell and we look down a gradually darkening corridor toward the end of life. But what we find is that as we look in those moments of trial and testing, not only is there a dark space waiting for us, but there is also the shepherd. There is still the rod and the staff of guidance, the strong arm of comfort and care from a shepherd who loves us and reassures us, even in our darkest valley. We may not be delivered from the dark valley as, as quickly as we would like, but we know that we are not alone. And because we are not alone, we have nothing to fear, for God is with us. Often, when life draws to a close for someone, when it's their turn to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, faithful people inevitably reach out for this old friend that we read today, Psalm 23. And it's not only because they know it by heart, it's not only because it's the scripture implanted in their soul, but it's because this psalm dares to speak about the end. This psalm dares to speak about those dark valleys where we might feel alone or abandoned by God, and it names the dark valleys of our life as a place where the Good Shepherd is and cares for us and guards us and comforts us. It's not many funerals I've been to where Psalm 23 
wasn't spoken or prayed or sang or offered in some way. Friends, when life makes us wonder if God is there for us, if God cares for us, it is the good shepherd of Psalm 23 who can put comforting arms around us and reassure us that the God we love, the God we worship, the God of goodness and mercy and faithful love is the one who leads us, who restores us, who comforts us, prepares us, anoints us, so that whether we find ourselves in a dark valley or in a sunny meadow, whether we are in the midst of life or death, we might know and trust that we dwell with God. It's that point when the psalmist begins to talk about the dark valley that he changes his shift of perspective. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but as you go through those familiar images of comfort and green pastures and still waters, the psalmist is talking about God, what God does for us. But as we come to the dark valley, the psalmist changes his perspective and begins talking to God. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I know that you are with me. It's that shift in perspective that deepens each of our faith walks. Talking about God is safe. We can hold God in an arm's length distance. We can have an intellectual conversation about scripture. We can talk about the history and all the different interpretations people have offered. But when we begin talking to God, we begin to do something risky. We risk, sorry, we risk intimacy. I'll try not to move so much. When we begin talking to God, we risk the intimacy of relationship. It's only when we begin talking to God instead of about God that we learn to pour out our fears and our joys at the feet of our Lord. We confess to God our shortcomings, and we receive the grace that Jesus paid his life to give to us this precious gift. When we start talking to God instead of about God, we learn how scripture not only informs our intellectual understanding of who God is, but we also learn that scripture has something to do about our lives right now. It changes the way that we live each and every day. When we begin talking to God, we learn how to surrender, how to give it all to God and to risk that relationship and let God guard our souls. To learn that we don't have to defend ourselves by ourselves. But that God will be with us. To love us, to comfort us, to guard us. When we risk that relationship and begin talking to God instead of about God, that's when something might happen that we can't predict. When God might change the way that we see the world in a way that life is never the same. Where God might ask us to do something that we would never want to do of our own will or volition. Where God might ask us to step out in faith and try something different so that we might experience or share love in a new way. Talking about God is not what gives us calm or peace or rest or strength. It's only when we talk to God, when we have a relationship with God, that we receive these gifts of faith, when we know, when we trust that God is the guardian of our soul, that's when we can walk through the darkest valley and have no fear. Friends, we are being pursued by God's goodness and love all the time, every day, all of our lives long. The message that Jesus brings us in the Gospels and the message of Psalm 23 are one in the same. They're an offer to deeper relationship with the Savior of our souls. They're an offer to follow the Good Shepherd of our lives. They're an offer to let God be the guardian of our souls, to let him lead us to still waters so that we might be restored by love and mercy and goodness and kindness. Will Willimon, a United Methodist bishop, tells a story that brings that last line of this Psalm 23 to life. He talks about a mean old man in the town where he grew up who was resentful and bitter. 
where the people of the town said that his bitterness really was justified. His beloved wife had died during giving birth to their one child, and not long after, the child had died as well. So the people in the town said, this man has every reason to be bitter, and they just left, let him go on about his business. This old man never went to church. He never had anything to do with anyone, and in his late 60s, they carried him out of his apartment and over to the hospital to die, Will Wallamon says. No one visited, no one brought flowers, and he went to the hospital to die alone. But there was a nurse there. Well, Will Willimon says she wasn't actually a nurse yet, she was just a student. And she was in training, and because she was still training, she hadn't learned everything that they teach you in school about the necessity to detach yourself from your patient, to have that distance so that when the inevitable pain of death comes, you'll be able to still care for that person without crossing a boundary or being taken out uh, with sadness and grief overwhelming you. And so this student nurse befriended this old and bitter man. It had been so long since he had friends, Willimon says, that he didn't know how to act with one, someone reaching out to him. So he told this nurse, go away, just leave me alone. But she would still come and try. She would smile and get him to eat his jello, and at night she would tuck him in, and he'd growl back, I don't need anybody to help me. He was the kind of person who thought he didn't need a guardian or a shepherd. But soon, Willimon says, the man grew so weak that he didn't have the strength to resist the student nurse's kindness. Late at night, after her duties were done, she would come and pull a chair up and sit by his bed and sing to him as she held his old, gnarled hand. And he looked up at her in this dim lamplight of the hospital room and wondered if he saw the face of a little girl who he never got to see grow old as an adult. And a tear formed in his eye when she kissed him goodnight. And for the first time, in maybe 40 or 50 years, the old man said to her, God bless you. And so as she left the room, Willimon says, there were still two others who remained. Two others who whispered softly in this old man's ear the last words he heard before slipping into that dark valley. Those two others were goodness and mercy. Will Willimon says, they whispered in this old man's ears, gotcha. Because goodness and mercy are always pursuing us, friends. Whenever we wander down the crooked paths of life, when we feel like we've been overwhelmed by the hardship that life throws our ways, goodness and mercy are always there, ready to meet us and pursue us, even into our deepest and darkest valleys. So perhaps today, Goodness and mercy might whisper in our ears, gotcha. May we share that goodness and mercy with our neighbors, with our community, with the whole world, until everyone comes to know the love and care of the Good Shepherd. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, our hymn of sending is number 2108 from the Black Hymnal, The Faith We Sing, Oh How He Loves You and Me. We stand and join as we offer praise to the guardian of our souls.
interested in here, I'd like to invite you to come and join me here at the front of the sanctuary. Yeah. Robbie, you want to turn that off and I'll grab the handheld? Nathan and Carol, uh, we send you with bittersweet feelings of this new chapter in your life. We are so very grateful for all the love and care that you have offered to this congregation. And I'm very grateful for the love, care, and support you've offered to me as uh, the pastor of this church. Uh, and we are sure that goodness and mercy will follow you in this next chapter in Asheville. And so we want to send you with blessing. Will you allow us to do that? Friends, I invite you to turn to the insert in your bulletin. There will be parts for me to read and for you to read as we offer this prayer of blessing to our dear, dear friends. The church is a family united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are all brothers and sisters. And for a time, Millington First United Methodist Church is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home in a different place. For a time, Nathan and Carol Rawls have lived with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's heavy loads. Together we have laughed and cried. Together we have worshipped and praised God. Together we have lived. We feel sorrow in your leaving, yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support, yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be your new church family as you have added much to our lives. We will pray for you and for the whole family of God. Friends, let us pray. O oh God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Nathan and Carol, who are about to leave us. Keep and preserve them, O oh Lord, in all health and safety, both of body and soul, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Nathan and Carol. Go in the peace of Christ. Our prayers go with you. Amen. As our acolytes come to receive, uh, to gather the light of Christ to lead us out and the cross which we proclaim, I invite you to join me in our benediction. Friends, we have been refreshed and restored. We have been called and guided. Let us go forth knowing who our true shepherd is. We will follow God's path. Secure in the knowledge that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join us in the benediction response. He is Lord. It can be found on page 177. <laughs> Thank you.